Welcome to GeoInteresting, presented by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Today, we get a look at the historical significance of Matthew Fontaine Maury, a 19th century pioneer in the study of the ocean and modern navigational techniques. John Grady, a former managing editor of Navy Times and a Maury biographer, recently visited NGA Springfield, Virginia campus to discuss this seminal figure in the development of maritime tradecraft and his importance to NGA's mission. Well, good morning, and thank you for coming to our event this morning. I think you'll enjoy it. It's about one of the people who, are, who was fundamental to the tradecraft development that we employ here at the agency. Sometimes it's the side of our being that we don't pay nearly enough attention dwelling upon, and we should do a lot more of it. Our visitor today is Mr. John Grady, a managing editor of Navy Times for more than eight years and retired communications director of the Association of the United States Army after 17 years. He's had his biography of Matthew Fontaine Maury, a leading figure in the U.S. and Confederate navies. We have a picture of him in both uniforms. Published recently by McFarland Publishing. It's entitled Matthew Fontaine Maury, Father of Oceanography. and was nominated for the Library of Virginia's 2016 Nonfiction Award. Mr. Grady has contributed to many publications he is a journalist by trade, as I mentioned before. His work has appeared at, in USNI.org, Breaking Defense, Government Executive, GovernmentExec.com, NextGov.com, among others. But the most important thing is that he's taken some time off to do some history about a very, very interesting character who was on both sides of a, of a, a almost on both sides of the conflict we call the Civil War, but also fundamentally made a contribution to the way we manage the ocean and our society. And that's important for us, given the fact that 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean water. So without further ado, let me ask Mr. Grady to come up and begin his talk. Welcome, John Grady. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a small sore throat, courtesy of all the pollen that's been floating around. Uh, and what I wanted to do is, we're going to start off by showing you this picture. Does anybody know where this picture is from? Richmond. Uh, well, what street's it on? The, um, the Monument Avenue. <laughs> he is the last Confederate on Monument Avenue. Behind him, by one block, is the changed Richmond, Arthur Ashe, an Army officer. Maury is the only naval figure, and we start at Jefferson Davis, and then go through the pantheon of Confederate military heroes. He is the only naval figure up there. Also, with the exception of Davis, he is the only one not wearing a uniform. Because Maury, even though you have a picture of him with his ceremonial sword and his dress blues, rarely ever wore a uniform. He generally stayed in black frock coats so that he could more easily go in and out of the Navy Department and then go up to Capitol Hill and lobby the heck out of them for appropriations, for exploration, and more importantly to him, to make the Navy the handmaiden of commerce. So when I say explorations, you have to think whaling, cotton trade, coffee, flour. That's what he was most interested in in developing those trade routes. He probably was the most controversial naval figure of the 19th century. Gary mentioned that he was both a Confederate and, a, and in the uh, United States Navy. He also was one of the most divisive figures in American science. American science was beginning to look at itself as professional or popularizer. Maury was a popularizer. He was born far from the sea in Spotsylvania County on January 14, 1806 in what is now the Wilderness Battlefield. Actually, it's closer to Chancellor's Tavern. The battles took very close, were very near each other. His parents bought the land 
from Light Horse Harry Lee. And the connection between the Lee family and the Maury family stretched on from there. They not only knew each other as family members, they understood the failings and the gifts of both. Maury, like Light Horse Harry, Maury's father, Richard, like Light Horse Harry Lee, went bust. And they took off for the bluegrass of Tennessee. Maury wanted an education and adventure. Now, he was a middle son. There were six children. Six children lived to adulthood. His older brother was sent into the Navy because the trustees that controlled his mother's inheritance said that they didn't think John, the brother, the older brother, the oldest brother, would have any more success at farming than his father Richard. So they found him a position in the Navy as an acting midshipman. He was 14 years of age. We won't go into great amount of his career, but the tales that when he came back of being marooned on an island in the Pacific, fighting with David Porter at Valparaiso, being a prisoner of war of the British in the War of 1812, going to Lake Champlain to stop the invasion of the British down the corridor into cut New England and New York off after 1812 and return it to Britain, they stirred the young Maury soul. Like another older brother, Richard, he wanted an education, an education that wasn't homeschooled. The problem that he ran into, his father had so little money that he sent the next oldest son, Richard, to Harpeth Academy. Now, making that long story short, Maury fell out of a tree, Matthew, fell out of a tree, broke an arm, bit his lip, and his dad, saying that recovery is going to be a long time, said, I'll pay for your education. And he did. Maury never wanted to stay and become a cotton farmer like his father. They argued throughout his teenage years that he, too, wanted to go away. One of his teachers, William Hasbrook, said, well, you know, you got your cousin Abram here, and he's at the military academy, and that's free. And they want to have science and engineering. Maury thought about that for a while, and then said, nah, maybe not. Now, how do you get into the Naval Academy today? Well, there were, first of all, there was no Naval Academy back when Maury was a teenager, and he was quite instrumental in there being a Naval Academy. You still need a congressman's recommendation to get an acting commission. Now, who was the congressman from that district in Tennessee? A man named Sam Houston, whom we refer to as Sam Houston. Who was he? He was a veteran of the Creek Wars with Andrew Jackson. The political connections that Maury was able to use. Maury wrote his own recommendation. He wrote it to Houston, sent it on off to Washington, Houston looked at it, recognized the name Maury, not because of Maury's father, but because of Maury's uncle, and said, oh, okay. And by the way, if you can get here in time, the Navy is going to be taking Lafayette back. It's 1825. He's had his grand tour of the United States. We've given him 300,000 acres around Pensacola and said, do with it as you will. Thank you for liberating us 50 years ago. Well, to make the long story short, Maury did get that commission. He did serve on the ship that returned Lafayette, called Brandywine, because that was Lafayette's first big battle. Uh, it was originally named something else, which right now I've forgotten. They renamed it Brandywine, took him there, and he had his commission. What Maury, we're going to go into just, we're going to skip. He only had four major voyages. We're going to skip all but two. The first voyage that he made, as a sailing master, this was his actually second one, he decided he was going to write an article on navigation. It was called On Rounding Cape Horn. He saw that there was a book there. Now, in your corridor here, you have Nathaniel Bowditch. Maury said, naval midshipmen need a book like that but more understandable. 
And so he devoted himself to creating that book when he got through with that voyage. He then got, he got himself married. And what happened after he got married, of course, they had, a ch they had children. Uh, next picture, please. That's Fredericksburg today. And I always put up Ghoul Ricks in case you've never been down there. They still have a luncheon counter. It's one of the few drugstores I think in the United States it has. Maury's family was originally from here, as I said, Central Virgi Virginia. He went to the bluegrass the rest of his life when he wanted to return for comfort. He always came back to Fredericksburg. His wife was an orphan child of a banker in Fredericksburg. In 1835, when he was no longer sailing, he sat down after being married and began to write his book. He sent the book on navigation off to the guys who did the naval charts, Key and Biddle in Philadelphia. And that is the Biddle of Bailey, Banks, and Biddle, in case you people, well, people who understand how to make engravings and things like that. That is the same company. By that time, his wife was uh, pregnant with her first daughter, Elizabeth. Next slide, please. This is Betty Herndon Morey at age 35, actually slightly after the Civil War. She wrote a magnificent diary that you should go look at if you want to see the Southern refugee uh, thinking of the end of the Civil War. She looks exactly like her mother looked at that age. It's an amazing thing. You would think that they were not, they could have been sisters. Maury, you would think, would stay home with the wife and the child. Nope, he was off to Philadelphia because he wasn't hearing from Key and Biddle how the work was progressing. He was living on $40 a month, now with a wife and child to support. So he takes off to Philadelphia. He couldn't even afford cheese and crackers diet to complete that book. In a letter to his brother Richard Dick. Maury daydreamed the book guaranteed his promotion to lieutenant with 10 years of service. On this, he was dead wrong. On April the 29th, 1836, Key and Biddle applied for the copyright on the new, new theoretical and practical treatise on navigation by M.F. Maury, comma, past midshipman, comma, U period, S period, Navy. It's the first scientific book written by a naval officer, I should say by a United States naval officer. Despite the secretary's ordering the book to be put in all ships' libraries, which didn't mean much, there were only about 20 ships on active duty in the entire United States Navy at the time, Maury could not stand what happened to him at the handling of Malin Dickerson. Next slide, please. Now, this man should also be in your pantheon here at NGA. This is Alexander Dallas Beach who was at that point not the head of the Coast Survey, but was in charge of the Central High School in uh, Philadelphia. Here you see him taking uh, fixings. Beach became one of Maury's greatest, greatest rivals through the history of science. Beach, at the time of the book, however, praised to the high heavens Maury's work in navigation. Bache was a graduate of the Military Academy. He had two brothers in the Navy. His father had been postmaster of Philadelphia, ran off with funds, went to, what is it, GTT, as they would write on, on uh, houses that were abandoned in Tennessee, gone to Texas. And that's where he went. He was the only person in the Texas legislature to vote against joining the United States. And he was living on Galveston Island. It fueled his writings, this navigation book, and then the one trip that he made, the first circumnavigation of the, of the globe by a United States war vessel, and that was Vincennes. And he was a midshipman at that point. And you have to imagine what this boy from Tennessee, young man from Tennessee at this point, saw. He had been to Brazil, he had been on the west coast of South Africa, now he was on the same island that his brother had been marooned on. He was in China. He was in the Philippines. He was in Malaysia. They were at Cape Town. They stopped at St. Helens to go to the grave of Napoleon. 
sailed back to Rio de Janeiro and then ended up back in Norfolk. He now had the experiences of a lifetime that he poured into his most important book and probably the most popular oceanographic book ever written, The Physical Geography of the Sea and Its Meteorology. Now that was published in 1855. The voyage he didn't make, which is equally important, was the South Seas Exploring Expedition that was originally called for by John Quincy Adams in his initial State of the Union address. What, if you go down to the Museum of Natural History on the mall today, you will see part of the collection that Lieutenant Charles Wilkes, who self-promoted himself to Captain Charles Wilkes for the trip, not just Commodore, because he was commanding several ships, he created his own rank of captain, and this makes up the base of that collection. Now, standing on the other side of the mall is that big statue of Joseph Henry, and we'll get into Joseph. Joseph, if he knew that there were all these museums down on the mall, probably would have put a gun to his head and start tearing things down. What they wanted, what the Navy wanted out of all of this stuff, the scientists in the United States wanted this to be James Cook, George Vancouver. They wanted it to be like the French. They wanted it to be like the Russians were starting to do by hiring Barry. Bring scientists with you and we will find all this stuff. Well, what did the Navy want? Well, the Navy wanted charting data. They wanted astronomical sightings for improved navigation. And they also wanted to bolster the nation's claims to specific lands. Oregon for one. And when you think of Oregon, don't think of the state now. Think back past Missoula, Montana and then go up into Canada and draw a straight line across about where Calgary is. That's what they considered Oregon. They also wanted to drive the British whalers out of the Sandwich Islands, Hawaii. If nothing else, poking around these waters would be America's thumbing its nose at British pretensions, here, there, and elsewhere. When approval finally came from the White House and Congress to go and take this, the Navy fell into incredible click rivalry as to who was going to command. It finally took the Secretary of War, Joel Poinsett, not the Secretary of the Navy, to determine who was going to lead this expedition. He chose Wilkes. Morey said, I've dealt with Wilkes before. I can't go on this. Maury was to be the astronomer of that expedition, which was probably the plum scientific assignment afloat. While on shore leave then, Maury got word from his parents, still living in Tennessee, that they were ailing and probably needed to find a place to stay close to family. He went to Tennessee, arranged temporarily to send them to a sister who lived outside of Memphis, actually in Mississippi, but as you know, that's not that far, far away. And they stayed there for the winter. As Maury was coming back by stagecoach, there wasn't railroads that went all that, that distance, he offered his seat to a woman who got on near Cambridge, Ohio. As the stagecoach was heading to Somerset, Ohio, basically if you go up Interstate 77, you'll, you're following that route, the stagecoach caught on the side of the road a rut due to construction. And Maury, who had given up his seat and was riding on the top, crashed to the ground. His leg was broken in multiple places, and he also had some other, in, in, uh, some other arm injuries. Maury's naval career was in jeopardy. If he could not go to sea, even though you spent more time at home, get out of the Navy. And there was no such thing as retirement as we understand it now. It would have to be an act of Congress in your name, a prayer, what they call prayers for relief. And then they would either give you a lump sum or agree to pay you a pension of whatever amount. 
Morey began to write. He wanted to expose the ills of the Navy. Now, Morey very rarely ever wrote under his own name because when you're taking pot shots at somebody, you probably, even if you want to get back on active duty, eh, probably a good idea not to use your name. He wrote under the name Harry Bluff in Union Jack. Most of the time he was attacking the Navy organization, the actual structure of the Navy. They did not have a chief of naval operations. They did not have bureaus. They had five commissioners. That sometimes they had three. Most of the times they had five. And they sort of divvied up what the uh, Navy was going to do. And oh, here's sitting the secretary over here, and he didn't really sort of control the commissioners. He sort of said he would go up to Capitol Hill and get the appropriations. It was a revolving door for the secretaries. Uh, even after the reforms that Morey was one of the great leaders in pushing through, Morey had three secretaries in the Navy in six months. So when I say revolving door, I mean revolving door. They were in and out. One of the publications that he wrote in was called the Southern Literary Messenger. Among the biggest supporters of the Southern Literary Messenger was a politician, former governor, former senator, John Tyler. Another one was this federal judge who had this peculiar, peculiarly tough for a Virginian views of slavery, Abel Parker Upshur. Abel Parker Upshur believed slavery, like John uh, Calhoun, was a God-given good. They were regular contributors and probably also helped finance the Southern Literary Messenger. Morey began writing on naval reform in there. More importantly, as Morey was recovering from these injuries, he tried to get back on active duty. The doctors who examined him in Fredericksburg and uh, again in Washington said no, and his wife is writing, or going to his friends, Judge Lomax in particular in Fredericksburg, going to him and saying, I need you to write to the Navy Department and make sure that Matthew Fontaine Morey does not get back on active duty. So Parker. William Henry Harrison wins the election, manages to give this unbelievably long inaugural address, catches pneumonia, 31 days afterwards, he's dead. Tyler's down in Charles City County, Virginia, with his new bride, and word gets to him, you're the president. Tyler tells Henry Clay, the leader of the Whigs, and he supposedly was elected as a Whig, I'm not backing your, your national bank. Clay arranges to have the entire cabinet resign with the exception of Daniel Webster, who's negotiating a treaty with the British to determine where the boundary is between Maine and the Mississippi River. Lo and behold, at who do they finally turn to to come into the Navy who have reorganized us? Upshur is a great navalist. You find among the Southerners, Upshur being one of them, you find it in Calhoun, you find it in uh, King, you find it in Charles Conrad. Why? They wanted to sell cotton around the world. So they became strong supporters of the Navy. Upshur was one of the great reformers of the Navy. Upshur said, come on, we're going to put you in the Bureau of Hydrography and Ordnance. You're going to run the charts and depot. Uh, and, and, excuse me, the, whatever, the small charts and depot thing. A year and a half later, James Gillis, who also, also ought to be celebrated as one of the great naval scientists of this time, had successfully lobbied Congress to get the Navy put in charge of an, of an observatory. Nobody, nobody expected the Navy to get that. But Gillis was relentless in lobbying Congress to get it, and he got it by having no votes against everything else. So by default, the Navy ended up running it. John Quincy Adams, who first called for the National Observatory, was incensed. Morey managed to calm down. Who did Upshur then turn to to head the observatory? Another Virginian. Morey, come on back in. We'll, we'll take care of you. 
After the, more, uh, after the war with Mexico, the observatory was viewed as one of the service's better shore assignments. Duty there during the, in, during the 1840s was an assignment sought by the Navy's brightest young officers, David Dixon Porter, Robert Minor, uh, 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 Hunter Davidson. You go on and on and on, and you start to find that these names keep popping up. Hard work is glorious, is what Maury wrote. He wrote to William Whitey, who had been on Slave Coast duty off West Africa, and said, come to work here. What he then began to make popular in the observatory was his mottos. And he would always go up to the naval officers there, they'd usually be 8 to 10, and you know, the civilians varied from 5 to 12, and go, cui bono. Now, remember, he only had a couple of years of ed real formal education. And cui bono, for those of you who are not Latin scholars or have no idea what I just said, it means for whose benefit. And this is what he wanted constantly from the work of the observatory. Now, you would think the observatory would be primarily concentrated on the skies. Well, the problem is that Maury never got away from his interest and the congressional funnel of money going to the oceanographic work, or what became oceanographic work, versus the astronomical work. And so they began to fall further and further behind. Next slide, please. We're going to skip ahead. That's Wilkes. Skip ahead. That's more a, probably the one classic picture that we do know that this was painted at the observatory, and he must have been dialed up for this one. And the next picture, please. Okay. We're going to leave that one there. Maury kept building on a theory that if he delineated every track, and they had already started to collect these log books, not only from the what they called the public cruisers, those were naval vessels on missions, but also from merchant mariners and whalers, which drove the Royal Navy crazy. They had never trusted the whalers. But they started to get the log books coming in. And so what he wanted to do was create tracks through the sea. What was happening was they were wasting all this time trying to delineate everything. But what he wanted to eventually come up with was this. Books, if I may say so, impart information through the ear. These charts, as he envisioned them, through the eye and therefore in a manner and form is much more condensed and, in, and invaluable. What he started to do was he started to look at a specific route. And that specific route was the most popular one for the Navy. That was to Rio. Now, he did it from Baltimore and Norfolk. Because there was a Brazilian squadron, they needed to have the best routes. If you looked at how they sailed those before, they went to the coast of Africa and then let themselves be blown back. Maury found that coasters sticking to the coast of South Africa, or no, South Africa, coming across the coast of South America, hugging the coast, you could still get into Rio and you would save time. The average time was 55 days using the let's go by Africa route. A guy named Jackson <coughs> carrying flour from Baltimore to Rio made it in 38. Guess what? Coming back, because he picked up the Gulf Stream, now he's loaded with coffee, made it in 37. Needless to say, that then became the route. It was a single route that changed everything. Almost all the Navy charts started to look at that kind. And why? Because they, were, they believed that if they got this information, they could then pass it on to the American merchant mariners, and they would find their value. Congress would see the value of the Navy and maybe divert some money to them. Navies are very capital intensive. Uh, next slide, please. That's Baltimore Harbor. Actually, that's Fells Point. Uh, it's after the Civil War. I think it's 1875 or something like that. But the point here is these were all sailing vessels. 
None of the vessels that Maury was for the original charts had steam. He needed currents and he needed to know winds. What then, with that discovery by Jackson of shaving off time, a man named Robert Bennett Forbes, who was at Old China Hand, and dozens of Atlantic Coast uh, maritime merchants, underwriters, and shipbuilders, began to see the value of the Navy charts, and they too put pressure on the Congress to pay for those charts. The interest Maury created in nautical science could not have come at a more propitious time. You had the amalgamation of two scientific organizations into what is now the American Association for the Advancement of Science. That then went back into other merchants give us more logbooks. Endorsements flowed in like, you know, like a river. What they wanted to do then, after 1848 and the discovery of gold, oh, what were the two things? We've got gold, 1848, clipper ships, about 1846. So you had this combination of fast ships, and you had gold. You had to get the gold from Sutter's Mill, or the American River, back around the Horn, and then back up to New York. What's the problem? It's still a long time. Merchant, uh, the merchant said, we don't want to go around the Horn. It's too dangerous not to be carrying that amount of gold. What's the best route across? Do we go across the Yucatan Peninsula? There's a story in the New York Times today about the Chinese trying to build uh, their canal across Nicaragua. Do we go there or do we go across Panama? Panama is the shortest route. Problem there, it may be the shortest, but they put an awful lot of jagged mountains in there. How do you get them across? Are you going to build a canal? Maury said, nah. The best spot is Panama. But what we're going to do is we're going to have two ports, one on the Atlantic, one on the Pacific. I think that's the Atlantic. It may still be part of the Caribbean at that point. But anyway, we're going to have one on the east, one on the west. We're going to go as far inland as we can with a railroad. Then you're going to get on a mule, and you're going to go over to the other side, and you get on another railroad, and then you're going to get on this ship, and we're going to cut the time to California by half. We're going to make California part of the United States. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Maury began writing with his charts things called the sailing directions. It actually has a larger essays on the winds and currents and sailing directions was the actual full title. This is a weather log that they wanted kept. Now, why did he want the weather? Well, as we noted, the ocean 70% of the or water is 70% of the Earth's surface. The weather is so vari variable in different parts of the world. Anybody who has been in the Indian Ocean knows about the monsoon season. If you have lived in Arizona, which is very inland, there is another monsoon season. And this is what he was trying to capture, to get that exact times within a week or so of when this occurs. And therefore, you can make voyages safer, you can make journeys safer, and you can stand a better chance of getting the cargo through. Now, we're moving toward 1840. We're moving past the war with Mexico. The United States now controls 50% of what had been Mexico. There was also telegraph lines being laid across the eastern part of the United States. What was important about those telegraph lines? Not just that you got war news from Mexico. You could use those, the time that it took from a signal in Washington to Baltimore or Washington to Philadelphia to determine longitude. The Navy wanted control of that. The Coast Survey under Beach said, you're already poaching on our territory, coming in looking at the Gulf Stream. We want control of that. Uh, next slide, please. This is an ad for a clipper ship. 
and it tells you how you can get your voyage. The charts you can find today. Uh, you can actually see the original chart. Well, probably not the original charts. The original charts are hanging in Joe Biden's home at the uh, Naval Observatory on Massachusetts Avenue. When you come in to the house, to the sides are all the ocean charts. They're beautiful. They're absolutely gorgeous. If you want to see copies of those charts, go to the map room, which I think is the fifth floor, but it's in the Madison building of the Library of Congress. They're there. And they are not small. They are huge. When he said he wanted the eyes to picture it, the eyes can picture it. And they're in different colors. The problem is by 1858, they had so many tracks through them, you couldn't actually figure out, I couldn't figure out where they were going. Uh, but every one of those ships carried Maury's charts. The reason being was you sent your logbook in, we send you charts. Oh, you're going, uh, you're going to Bombay? Oh, not a problem. We got a chart for the Indian Ocean. Here it comes. You send us the logbooks back, we'll send you new charts. And if we made a mistake in the charts, guess what? The next time we print them, we're going to correct it. Ever since Andrew Jackson's second term, California won uh, in the Mexican War, seemed a secondary prize to Oregon. What I want to skip ahead, go to the next slide, please. This is San Francisco Harbor in 18, early 1850s. Once a ship arrived from anywhere, what did they do? The crew got off and abandoned it and headed to the gold fields. If you needed a ship, you could find it in San Francisco Harbor. Ambitious men always knew that if you could get this, this gold across, then you were in great shape. Keeping the crews became the problem. The problem, the way around the problem, at least from the steamship company's point of view, was to go to Congress and say, you know, you got all these naval officers on half pay. And by the way, we've got all these steamships. And don't you, doesn't your Navy need to have officers that were trained in steam? Don't you need some engineers to handle those ships? Well, you know, if you'll pay their salary, We'll give them a job. They can work for our steamship company on the East Coast, or they can work for our company on the West Coast. And in case we go to war again with Great Britain, guess what? They can come back on naval service and we'll give you their ship, or give you the ship that they're master. If you look at it from the point of view of Congress, this is a money-saving venture. If you look at it from the steamship company's point of view, who makes the money? We do. The odds of us going to war with Britain is pretty, pretty slim. One of the great steamship captains turned out to be Maury's uh, brother-in-law, William Lewis Herndon. Those of you who have been to the Naval Academy would know that there's the Herndon obelisk there. Herndon died in 1857 when he was a commander, or not the commander, he was a captain of a uh, gold-carrying vessel and passenger vessel called Central America. When Central America went down, he was heroically, the captain stayed, was, was the last man. He stayed with the ship. They were carrying so much gold, that caused the species run that led to the Panic of 1857. However, Herndon was regarded as one of the great heroes of, of the entire Navy le leading up to the Civil War. And the obelisk was built by his compatriots in the Navy. Ironically, it stands across a small little green from Maury Hall. What the, the point of having Herndon mentioned in this, Herndon did one of the great explorations of all times, which was of the Amazon. Maury was convinced that America needed, the United States needed, an outlet for slaves. The Amazon in Brazil would be that outlet. He believed that they would, American slave owners could move on down to Brazil, be welcome to develop the country, and eventually become part of the United States. What he wanted to do, what he wanted to do was this. Take the pressure off slavery in the South. Now, some people look at that as 
being not abolitionist, but a gradual abolitionist. Look at it from the other perspective. If you look at the world from Maury's perspective at this point, and you're thinking Amazon, you're looking down, Cuba's over here, Hawaii's over here, Central America is here, and we're controlling traffic through Panama, and then there's these fertile lands down there in the Amazon, and the Navy already knows what's over on the west coast with Peru. Think of manifest destiny not just going east and west. Think of manifest destiny going south. You don't have the British, they're up north. Those republics are constantly in rebellion. You have an empire that's tottering in Brazil. That fueled Maury's drive politically. What fueled their drive commercially was when gold was discovered in Australia. Maury then turned to find a way to tweak the British lion's tail. How do I get gold from Australia to London? Oh, by way of New York. Let's see if we can do that. He asked for $3,300 to print more charts of a run across the south. And that was to get the gold. Next, uh, next, uh, next slide, please. This is the wind and current charts reduced from about the size of that screen deeper to what it looks like. This was from the 1852 sailing directions, and it ref reflects Jackson's uh, voyage from uh, Baltimore to, uh, to Brazil. Next slide, please. That Central America going down in the hurricane, heroically drew, uh, drawn for Harper's. Next slide, please. This is a license to mine gold in Australia. I was stunned. The licenses only went for 30 days. You better find it quick because then you got to go back in and go get another one. At least in the California gold fields, when you took out the license, the SA office, I think, gave you 60 days to find something. When it finally got into Alaska, they gave you uh, six months. But, of course, the six months, you may be able to do any digging for four because everything then refroze. But this is a 30-day license to dig gold. And this is from one of the more prosperous fields. Next slide, please. This is where Maury's greatest benefit to a specific industry came, the whaling charts. Now, where were the whales in the United States economy at that point? Cotton was the number one export. Flour was number two. Tobacco may have been number three and falling. Whale oil was needed for lamps. Other byproducts were needed for perfumes. Other byproducts were used for shoe polish. Other byproducts were used for the heels of men and women's boots. <coughs> whaling moved from fourth to third. How many whaling ships were there? 700 in the United States in 1850. How many were there in the British whaling fleet? About 200. And where were these guys going? They were going all over the place. They were down in Antarctica. They were up in the Arctic. They were off Japan. They were over coasting down by, uh, <coughs> excuse me, off what is now Angola. And they're sending back their log books. They're sending you even more detail of where they go. And unlike the merchant mariners, they write notes. They write letters to Maury and say, hey, look what we found over here. And Maury's writing all of this down. 
it's not only going into the sailing directions, they're putting it in to new and revised charts that not just benefited the whaling industry, but maritime commerce as a whole. Morey had another expression that he used all the time, and he used it all the time against Joseph Henry and Alexander de la Spage. I said, to whose benefit? Well, this would be a whose benefit. The other thing Morey was getting from them was more meteorology, and since they were also working on land, he was getting weather information on land, which is what he wanted to combine the two. So his other motto was Cour non, another Latin phrase. Why not? <coughs> Henry would say, why? Maury would answer, why not? What I wanted to show you today was how the development of what your agency does from its very primitive start with those hydrography sound and the soundings, also with the charts themselves. We didn't go into the astronomical part of this, uh, but I thank you very much. GeoInteresting is produced by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, Office of Corporate Communications. Never miss an episode of GeoInteresting by subscribing on iTunes or SoundCloud. For more information about NGA, visit us at www.nga.mil, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Thanks for listening.